Thank you very much. And earlier this week, I was sharing a podium at South Lake Tahoe with the governor of Nevada. And when I was introduced, and then he was introduced, they said that the budget of the resources agency is larger than the budget of many states in the western United States. So he leans over to me and says, uh, how big's your budget? And so I said, well, it's $10 billion. And he, went, oh. and he gets up and he says, the state of Nevada's budget is $8 billion. <laughs> He's got $2 billion more on me. Um, and then I can't, can't resist uh, starting with a story that is sort of unrelated but very topical. And, and that is, is that I get home from Sacramento at the end of the week and my spouse gets home at about the same time and he's worked in a hair salon in Los Altos for 30 years and he gets home and I said, well, how was your day? And he says, oh, there was this huge argument at the salon. The head of the salon said, um, she just doesn't believe the accuser of uh, Brett Kavanaugh. It's just awful. And so one of my co-worker spoke up and said, well, she's been a client of mine for 10 years, and I believe her integrity, and she's telling the truth. And I said to John, a client in your salon? And he says, oh, yeah, she comes in all the time. I talk to her regularly. And I said, when were you going to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> and with great uh, just joy, he says, you're not the only one that knows big deal people in the family. <laughs> So I just couldn't get over that. I kept coming back to it in the evening because it was, it, it was really good. Um, and by the way, I, I wouldn't be able to go home tonight if I didn't tell you. He has open studios the second and third week of October. Please come by. <laughs> Uh, uh, we had 400 people last year. We would love to have you. You can just eat and sit in the garden if you want. Um, but thank you for inviting me to speak today. I do this, I've done, I don't know how many cycles I have done this for the DWC. And it, every time I think, oh, I'll just start to look at these. And then it becomes an intense research uh, thing. Because as uh, Mike said, there's even one of them till now I'm mildly confused about because of who's backing it and how it's against what you think would be happening with the initiative. So there are 11 on the ballot and I'm going to go through them and say what they do, uh, what the impact is of the major interests like the Democratic Party, Republican Party, State Chamber of Commerce, Labor Federation, uh, who's taken what position, uh, where the money's coming from, wh which newspapers have endorsed, and in a few occasions, who some of the major figures are that have endorsed. And this is a moving target. Uh, with regard to the money, uh, the last report was made on July 31st, but starting August 8th, they have to report any contribution over $1,000 on the same day, within 24 hours. And so that is really helpful. That uh, tells us who's moving money. And the newspapers are uh, just endorsing by the day. And the thing about the newspapers is you almost have to know who the newspapers are to understand what the significance is. If the San Diego Union Tribune and the Orange County Register are generally conservative, so you, you have to do that. The B the San Francisco Chronicle and the LA Times, they're mixed, but they tend to be a little more on the other side, and so some of those endorsements uh, uh, will tell you. This isn't a debate. It's my goal to be even-handed and try to let you uh, decide. There was a law passed, I think it was before 2014, that all major amendments would come on a November ballot and it was because there were a lot of ballot measures in June when the turnout was much lower and much more conservative. So the legislature decided they should be uh, on November of even number years. That means that the ballot is just jammed. And uh, uh, when I did this two years ago, there were something like 18 propositions and they were all big deals. And so we have 11 and some of them are big deals and a couple of them 
are almost radioactive in just how controversial they are on both sides. So I'm going to do my best uh, 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 to tell you. And then there's one, before I get into the propositions, there's one other thing that's very interesting this time. And that is there were three other propositions that qualified or had the signatures and didn't appear on the ballot. Uh, one of them actually made the ballot and was assigned a number. It was dividing California into three states. And it was Proposition 9. And the Supreme Court removed it from the ballot. And the Supreme Court removed it from the ballot because the Constitution is really clear that only the legislature can propose dividing up the state. And since this came from petition and not the legislature, the Supreme Court removed it from the ballot. Uh, the person, Tim Draper, who's a venture capitalist who qualified it by contributing his own money, was outraged, called it corruption, uh, but said he was giving up because he had had a previous one to divide into six states. And so it relieves me of having to explain why Santa Cruz and Monterey would be in different states, <laughs> but Santa Cruz would be in the same state with Modoc County, which borders Oregon and, uh, uh, and Nevada. Uh, so that's not on the ballot, and that will be why I jump from Proposition 8 to Proposition 10 when I go through these. Okay. I'll hold it a little closer. But you could move a little closer, too. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm also, I don't want to drown out. I have another mic on for the TV broadcast, and I don't want to... Uh, have an echo for an hour and a half. And I will on my Facebook page the minute I get the link, uh, uh, put the link out there so that people can see and, and figure out how to get to this. Uh, the second uh, issue is that there were two ballot measures that got the required number of signatures, and in many ways it was a threat. It was, we're going to put this on the ballot and you're not going to like it. And in both cases, the legislature adopted something to push back on it or try to respond to the initiative, and the proponent of the initiative withdrew it before it went on the ballot. Because there's a new law uh, from three or four years ago that allows a proponent to change it after 30 days or remove it. And so one of them, uh, and there's a local angle to this, you can just tell on how people call it. Uh, the author called it the Tax Fairness Transparent, uh, Transparency and Accountability Act, and the League of Cities who opposed it called it the Corporate Tax Trick. So you can just imagine uh, uh, the difference between the two, and it would have basically required special votes for local taxes to be ad adopted. It would have invalidated a bunch of them that happened already. And in order to keep it off the ballot, and it was funded in a large part by soda companies, the legislature agreed that there couldn't be any soda taxes on the ballot for a decade or so. This outraged people. Our own Senator Bill Monning is an advocate for uh, taxes on sodas. The Santa Cruz City Council expressed its interest in putting a ballot measure on the ballot in November, which it can't do now because this law was passed. Bill actually voted against the bill in protest, uh, but it was signed into law, and this measure didn't go ahead. But the California Dental Association and the California Medical Association have announced their intent to do a ballot measure in 2020 that would invalidate this and allow for soda taxes. So if I'm doing this two years from now and you're here, I'll probably be talking about that uh, uh, as that continues. The other one was... Uh, a, I refer to him as a real estate mogul, uh, Alastair Mataggart, funded money for consumer privacy um, with regard to personal information or data and internet services. It was strongly opposed by AT&T and other companies that would be affected. And the legislature adopted a more narrow bill that did this. And then the author pulled it back. And there's still some of these interests that think they'll get the legislature to change it in the next session. But in both cases, I'd be talking about those if that little play didn't happen beforehand. So uh, there were three that also, uh, between the courts and these maneuverings, didn't get on the ballot. Now, 
uh, to, to get right into these. And <clears throat> handling it within our time will be a challenge. I'm going to hang around and answer questions just privately. If there's something where I've just totally confused you, shoot your hand up and I will uh, do it. But I'm going to try to get through this because it's really voluminous. And to be honest, it's really wonky in some ways. So I just hope you will bear with me. But you're going to have the facts. Uh, uh, you will know about each of these initiatives. And Proposition 1 was placed on the ballot by the state legislature. It authorizes $4 billion for housing, $3 billion in general obligation bonds, and $1 billion uh, that goes for veterans' home loans. Of the $3 billion, $1.8 billion is for affordable multifamily housing programs, which has been done in past bonds. That's grants to local entities to do that. $450 million for infrastructure programs, $450 million for home ownership programs, $400 million for farm worker housing. Uh, this was placed on the ballot by the legislature. It requires two-thirds. It had just enough votes in the Assembly, 56 to 21. In the State Senate, it was 30 to 8, largely uh, partisan votes. And it put the bond uh, on the ballot. Uh, the fiscal impact is that it would cost $170 million a year to the general fund over the next 35 years. And uh, that's because... Uh, that includes the interest in the period over which it would be paid off. And the first four measures, <clears throat> the first four measures are bonds. So let me digress for a second and explain about bonds, and then you'll know that that applies to each of the first four. Because bonds are, go for capital costs, meaning it goes for the construction of something. Uh, bonds can go for roads, for dams. Uh, for housing, just actual construction. And the only way you can do anything that's remotely considered non-capital costs is it includes paying for the planning. So if you're planning for a road, you can plan for the road and then have the money to build the road. But it provides no money to operate whatever it is. That has to come from the general fund. And the thing that uh, is the difficult thing is the bonds are paid off over the long term. Uh, one of them on the ballot is paid off over 40 years. One of them is backed by a revenue source. Two are paid off by the general fund over 35 years. And <clears throat> usually, it is roughly a $2 cost for every $1 of benefit. So if, if you do a dollar for housing, the, over the life of the bond, it's a dollar for the housing and a dollar for the interest. It costs almost double to pay it off. And in this administration, I proposed, with the backing of the administration a couple of years ago, that we change the system. We use half the money, and we just budget every year in the general fund the actual cost. And that means it wouldn't be what somebody referended. It would be what the legislature and the governor decided wasn't important, be half the cost. And then in an economic downturn, when things are really rough, you could pause it if you wanted to. Uh, right now, you can't pause the bonds. You could have a thing where you vote for money for new parks, and then the economy crashes, and you're buying the land for the new parks, and you're cutting park rangers, because in the general fund, you can't do it. Um, to be honest, that proposal didn't go very far. And it didn't go very far because <clears throat> Uh, the advocates want what they want, and they don't want it to be paused, and they want it to be assured. And uh, it was a really difficult thing for them. And the other thing to know is that there's a rule of thumb in budgeting, that your bonded indebtedness should never be more than between 5 to 6% of your general fund, so that you know that you always have enough to pay it off, and it's not getting into your other things. Well, then when the economy crashed uh, in 2008 and 9, <clears throat> the state general fund dropped by 20%. And Governor Schwarzenegger had done $15 billion in debt bonds just to balance the budget, and $50 billion for infrastructure that the voters approved. And suddenly it surged way out of the 5 to 6% safety zone because the general fund dropped, and nobody anticipated that. 
So when this governor came in, he uh, got the voters to raise taxes, and he paid off all the funds that had been borrowed from. He paid off the governor's debt bonds. He paid down a lot of the bonds, and we are back in the safety zone with a lot of the debt from the downturn paid off, but now we're seeing bonds again. And so it's up to the voters to decide if it's important enough for, to be a, a risk. And when I was budget chair, <clears throat> our program to provide dental care for children was $200 million a year. And the legislature, after I left, dropped it out because of the budget reductions. Well, <clears throat> one of these bonds would have roughly $450 million a year as the payoff for 40 years. And so you have to weigh, do you want that kind of payoff against the other things that are in the budget? That's really a hard question because it's very abstract to people sitting here like this. But those are some of the decisions that you're making by entering bonds. And so as I, going back to Proposition 1, supporting this measure are a lot of housing action groups. Affordable Housing Now, Homeless and Housing Coalition. Uh, they also, a lot of the campaign committees are joint for Proposition 1 and 2, so the same donors uh, carry over to Proposition 2. And the largest contribution was from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, if you recognize the names. Those are the married couple at the top of Facebook. And uh, the state building trades gave 150,000. A number of housing nonprofits gave 100,000. And there's no committee uh, that's been formed in opposition. Uh, the ballot statements in favor were signed by representatives of the California Disabled American Veterans, Habitat for Humanity, Congress of California Seniors, California Partnership to End Domestic Violence, California Veterans Assistant. And then the interesting thing is, is <clears throat> the ballot argument against was signed by a political gadfly who must be local because uh, uh, his name is Gary Wesley and years ago he ran against Bill Kelsey for judge here. So uh, it's a local gadfly and, um, and he wrote the argument against it. The state Democratic Party supports Prop 1. The state Republican Party opposes Proposition 1. The League of Women Voters supports the proposition, as does the California Labor Federation. The Chamber of Commerce has taken no position. The San Francisco uh, Chronicle is editorialized in favor, and the Sacramento Bee and Fresno Bee is in favor as well. San Diego Union Tribune in opposition. So that's the layout for Proposition 1, a little background for bonds. And then when you move to Proposition 2, it is bonds as well. And it's bonds for housing people with mental illness. But the nature of this one goes back to a ballot measure in 2004. And that ballot measure approved by the voters said that there'll be a 1% surcharge on anybody that makes a million dollars or more uh, um, in California and pays income tax, and that 1% surcharge will go to mental health services. It has raised between one and a half and two and a half billion dollars a year. And that's been a fact since then. Um, and the money is dedicated to mental health services and is uh, distributed to counties to do that. And what this does is this would issue $2 billion in bonds, uh, and it would take roughly $120 million a year from the revenues of the previous proposition and use them to back the bonds. So it would take existing revenues. It wouldn't go into the general fund. And what it really does is uh, there is a, a program that was started called the No Place Like Home Program created by the state legislature in 2016, and that would build and rehabilitate housing for those with uh, mental issues who are homeless or at risk of being homeless. The early results show this program has been successful in Los Angeles, and this ballot measure would take existing funds back to bonds and make that program statewide. And it's estimated that it could help with as many as 20,000 units of housing uh, are coming from it. And th the opposition to the initiative comes from some local people, uh, the ones that uh, 
assigned to the uh, ballot arguing against are from the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, from Contra Costa County. And it's my conjecture that deep down, they like the distribution now. They don't want that money to be touched for anything else. And then the people that support it are Mental Health uh, uh, America, California Police Chiefs Association, a formal member of the National Advisory Mental Health Council, the California chapter of the College of Emergency Physicians, the California Professional Firefighters, and the National Association of Social Workers. And um, despite the fact that there's an opposition uh, argument, I don't think there's been a committee formed to oppose this uh, initiative. The people that support it are the same donors I mentioned for Proposition 1 because they've donated to the two initiatives and they're running the, the pro campaign together. Uh, the California Democratic Party supports Proposition 2. The California Republican Party has taken no position. The League of Women Voters supports the proposition, as does the California Labor Federation. Uh, the California Chamber of Commerce has taken no position. And the Sacramento Bee, San Diego Union, and Santa Cruz Sentinel have editorialized in favor of Proposition 2. So those first two bonds are on housing. Three measures of the 11 have to do with housing. And then moving to Proposition 3, <clears throat> um, this is one of the most difficult ones to explain clearly. It is a new water bond. And it's difficult to explain clearly because it has more than 100 subcategories of funding. And you almost have to read it to know every single thing. It's for $8.9 billion. <clears throat> the cost of paying it off over 40 years, this is the one that would be paid off over 40 years, is $17.2 billion. And uh, it's confusing to people because there was a water bond adopted in 2014, and Prop 68 in the June ballot did $4 billion for resources, but it included things related to water. Both of those were put on by the legislature after a legislative process. This one was done by signature, and, to, and it's done by somebody I know very well who worked in the first Brown administration, Jerry Merrill, who was executive director of the League of Conservation Voters for years, who worked in my agency for the first two years of this administration. And he has done these ballot measures before. Uh, the last one he did 14 years ago failed. And he uses the same thing, which is, to say this very diplomatically, he raises the money from people that benefit from the specific allocations in the initiative. And uh, for anybody that's been in Santa Cruz a long time, he did the 1988 initiative that allowed the city of Santa Cruz to buy the pogo nip. And at that time, the Chamber of Commerce had to pledge a certain amount to the campaign to make sure that Poganip was in, because that's the way uh, that he operates these initiatives. And there's six main categories of expenditure. 2.5 billion for watershed health, 2.1 billion for drinking water, wastewater treatment, water recycling, rainwater collection, and water conservation, 1.4 um, billion for fish and wildlife habitat, 1.2 billion for existing connections and repairs to dams, canals, and reservoir, 1.1 um, billion for groundwater management, and 500 million for flood improvements. The full text of the measure is 52 pages. And um, it, it, as I said, it's too hard to go through the categories, but I decided to pick four items in the bond to sort of illustrate what it does. The first two are things that I think are really good things. It proposes $200 million to the Sierra Nevada Conservancy for the Watershed Improvement Program because the Sierra watersheds are very central to carbon capture, to water quality because 25 million Californians and 3 million acres of irrigated agriculture get their water from it originating in the Sierra. Um, the, I have to admit to being prejudiced, I authored the bill that created the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, and it's doing exactly what I hoped it would do, which is focus on those issues. And so 
that's a $200 million allocation. It would cost roughly $400 million uh, to pay off. What that does is a good thing. There's another uh, item of $70 million that would go to the Natural Resources Agency for the River Parkways program. And when Fred Keeley did two large, authored two large uh, bonds for uh, parks in the late 90s, he and the then speaker Antonio Villaraigosa changed what had been the historic practice because the historic practice had been the money overwhelmingly went to rural areas or forests or places where people didn't live in high concentrations and yet the people that paid the taxes and voted live in the urban areas and so they started a rough 50-50 split that 50% would go into the habitat or the forests or the places that were rural and 50% would go into the urban areas. One of the programs that was created to do that was the River Parkways program because most big cities have rivers and that's an option for recreation and investment. So the River Parkway program helped give money to the San Lorenzo River for the lights and other things. The Los Angeles River has been a benefit uh, to this and 70 million a dollars from this would go to this. Well, that's a good thing. Then there's a couple that are iffy, that sort of, even though I'm trying not to have a position, make me crazy. And the Oroville Dam is run by the state. And the Oroville Dam was constructed 97% by the ratepayers, the people that benefit from the uh, water from the Oroville Dam paid for the Oroville Dam. 3% was paid for the state because there was some flood control and some recreational benefit at Lake Oroville, 97.3. When the Oroville Dam had its problems, the bill was coming to roughly a billion dollars and that, under the current practice, would go to the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries would pay. That's the beneficiary pay process. This bond measure would say all state taxpayers would pick up 200 million of those repair costs at a cost of 400 million once it's paid off, and that would switch out of the beneficiary pays, and about a fifth of the cost of reconstructing the Orville Dam would be paid for by the California taxpayers, not the people that benefit from the dam. The other one is there's a $750 million allocation in this bond to repair and upgrade the Friant Canal, which is in the San Joaquin Valley. And this was created by the Central Valley Project in the 1930s. It is a federal project. It is not a state project. And it's because it's been there that long, there's needs for upgrades. But the other thing that's been happening is the Central Valley has had major subsidence uh, when people overdraft the underground aquifers, the land sinks. Well, around the Friant Canal, the land is sink, sunk, and there are some places where it has much less capacity to move water because of the subsidence. So they have to do repairs, and instead of the federal government supervising it through beneficiary pays, $750 million of it would be paid for by the state taxpayers, paid off over time in bonds, and... Um, in, in, and, and as I, I could just read an editorial and then I wouldn't have to own it, but then there have been substantial contributions to the initiative from people from that area. So that's the good of this initiative, and that's probably the bad of this initiative. Uh, the top five donors are Ducks Unlimited at 400,000, California Waterfowl Association, 275, California Wildlife Foundation, the American Pistachio Growers, the California Fresh Fruit Association, Congressman Jim Costa and John Garamendi, who represent places near Orville and near Friant, and one of the largest groups in support is the California Association of California Water Agencies. The acronym is AQUA, um, which represents all California water agencies. They like this emphasis on water. Um, and then CalMatters, a state news agency, they report in their research that business groups and farmers uh, have donated 1.75 million of the 2.75 million raised for the bond thus far. 
Republican gubernatorial candidate John Cox supports Proposition 3. Democratic candidate Gavin Newsom has taken no position. Uh, earlier this week, as I'm trying to catch these things that are happening right before I do this, the Speaker of the Assembly, Anthony Rendon, tweeted uh, two or three days ago that the 2014 water bond I authored was formulated through 18 public hearings throughout the state. Prop 3 does the opposite. It was devised in a back room of private interests who want money for their pet projects, not statewide uh, projects. He had enough characters, but he didn't then say, I oppose. He just said that. <laughs> and both the Republican and the Democratic parties have taken no position. The League of Women Voters opposes. The California Chamber and the State Labor, Labor Federation agree on this one. They both support it. The San Diego Union Tribune is in opposition. The Fresno Bee is in support. The Santa Cruz Sentinel has opposed. And then the San Francisco Chronicle editorialized against it under the headline of a pay-to-play water bond scheme, which is one of those things that if I were advocating it, I wouldn't want to get out of bed that morning. Um, and the, uh, the opposition art argument was signed by people that aren't really major players. They're the Solano County Taxpayers Association, because they take whoever submits and nobody else wanted to do that. Uh, the Sierra Club has opposed this measure all the way along and did one of those, don't sign it at the time it was being circulated. And their position paper was used as a basis of the Santa Cruz Chronicle and uh, San Francisco Chronicle and referred to in the Santa Cruz Sentinel editorial. So that's why Proposition 3 is just not clear. It's all those things. And the last of the four bonds is Proposition 4. It authorizes $1.5 billion in bonds to be paid from the state general fund to fund grants for construction, expansion, renovation, and equipping of qualifying children's hospital. It's a bond measure for children's hospitals. It designates 72% of funds to qualifying private nonprofit hospitals, 18% to UC general acute care children's hospitals, and 10% of funds to public and private nonprofit hospitals providing services uh, to eligible children. Uh, the state cost is $2.9 billion to pay off uh, the principal of $1.5 billion over a 35-year period. The annual payments uh, would be roughly $84 million a year. Uh, the argument for this, advanced by the children's hospitals, uh, is that some of the more complex health issues are treated in these hospitals, transplant, heart surgeries, and cancer treatments, and the state uh, general fund should help uh, with these costs. The, uh, uh, the argument against by our homegrown uh, local gadfly, Gary Wesley, is actually completely off subject. Uh, uh, he attacks the property tax system and property tax aren't involved in this initiative in any way. So he got to do a screed against property taxes, but that doesn't have anything to do with Proposition 4. Uh, uh, the real issue <clears throat> is just whether this is an appropriate use of general funds. Uh, other hospitals, private and public, construct their buildings through their own rates and contributions, but uh, this does those special processes. Interestingly, of the five major organizations I've been listing with positions on ballot measures, none support this. Um, the Democratic Party has no position. The Republican Party opposes. The League of Women Voters opposes. The California Labor Federation and the Chamber of Commerce have no recommendation. The Mercury News, San Diego Union Tribune, and Santa Cruz Sentinel have all editorialized in support. Um, they're uh, I don't think there's been a committee uh, formed to oppose this. The committee in favor of it uh, has raised over $10 million, and the contributions were $1.3 million each from the eight children's hospitals that would receive the bond revenue from the measure. Um, interestingly, uh, both three and four are funded by the people that would benefit it's just that I think the people that would benefit in Prop 4 are a lot more popular than the people would benefit in Prop 3. So uh, um, the California Teachers Association has taken a position in support of this measure, uh, as has Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom and a host of legislators and local elected officials. So that's Proposition 4. 
and the first four are all bonds. Now we move <clears throat> to those that are much more policy level uh, statewide measures. Uh, Proposition 5 would change the requirements for homeowners in transferring their property and what the property tax obligation would be when they transfer the property. Uh, Proposition 13, uh, basically in 1978, limited, uh, with certain exceptions, limited to 1% the, uh, the tax on 1% of assessed value for property. It had been roughly 3% on average across the state before Prop 13 passed. It allows for up to 2% a year increase if in fact inflation or, or costs have gone up uh, to that amount. And so over the 40 years since uh, Proposition 13 was enacted, uh, citizens who have owned their homes for a very long time uh, have lower assessments than people that bought their houses more recently. And <clears throat> that's true with me. <clears throat> you know, I've had my house 42 years. I have neighbors that are much newer on each side. They pay higher property taxes. That's just the way it works under the system. This has led to an economic incentive for long-term homeowners not to get out of their houses because they lose a low uh, property tax payment and assessment if they if they move. You, you know, um, and there were reforms passed in 1986 and 1988 to address this. Uh, when those were approved, it basically said. If you're a qualified homeowner, 55 or older, you can transfer the current taxable value of their original home to a replacement home. And you can only do this once, and the replacement home has to be less in cost, uh, sale cost, than the original uh, one where you're moving the value. So this has been a system that's been operating since the mid-80s. It's been used many times. I know people in Santa Cruz County that have used it. Uh, my mother uh, used it in Alameda County. And, uh, you know, it was just, my mom's a perfect example. There was a family home that was four bedrooms, two stories, and then by the time all the kids were gone and my dad was gone, uh, she's living in this big house, but they bought it for $39,000 in like something like 1970. So she wanted to move to a 55 and older, and as a complete side, she said, moving to this 55 and older place, it's like, it's people my own age. And I said to her, Mom, uh, all of your sons could live there with you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, I had to sort of snap her out of that for a second. Uh, 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 and, and so, that was much less in cost than the house, but she was still had a lower property value. She was able to take that with her, and it opened up a much larger house for a family to move into in a housing need. So that's the way it's worked. This initiative, which was put on primarily by uh, the Board of Realtors statewide, they're the major advocate, would allow home buyers who are 55 and older uh, to do this, no matter what the new home's market value was, now it has to be lower, the new home's location in the state, some counties don't necessarily do it, and it takes off the limit of one move. It says it could be any of a number of moves. Uh, the legislative analyst has determined that this would be a financial loss to local governments and schools of roughly $100 million dollars per year in the first years, rising over time to $1 billion a year. The initiative was filed and developed by the California Board of Realtors. Over $7 million has been raised for the ballot measure, $4.2 million by the California Board of Realtors PAC, and $3 million from the National Association of Realtors. The ballot argument in favor was signed by the Executive Director of the Highland Senior Center, the Commander of the AMVETS, uh, of California, the president of the Californians for Disability Rights, 
and a board member of the California Senior Advocates League. And to be honest, I think the Senior Advocates League is an organization that surfaces for ballot measures every uh, two years. Two former state finance directors, Tom Campbell and Mike Genest, were also signers in support. Just for reference, they were both finance directors under Arnold Schwarzenegger. And then there was an interesting story, just for color, um, in the Sacramento Bee this week that said, the realtors have not put any money into this campaign since March, and they're looking for alternatives in the legislature or a ballot measure again in 2020, which just implies they're giving up on it, but they would make no a public statement. The opposing arguments were signed by the president of the California Alliance for Retired Americans, uh, the president of the League of Women Voters of California, Tim Gage, also a former finance director, this one a finance director under Gray Davis, a board member of the Middle Class Taxpayers Association, the executive director of the National, National Housing Law Project, and the president of the California Congress of Seniors. Uh, also, in one of the ballot arguments, uh, Brian Rice, the president of the California Professional Firefighters, was listed in opposition. 1.6 million has been raised in opposition to this measure, 1 million from the Service Employees International Union, and 500,000 from the California Teachers Association being the largest amounts. The proponents uh, believe that this gives right to seniors to move, empowers retirees living on fixed incomes, and protects against a moving penalty. The opponents believe that this gives a tax break to wealthy Californians and will cause massive uh, revenue losses at the local level. If you look at <clears throat> the major groups, the state Democratic Party opposes this measure. Interestingly, the state Republican Party opposes it. The Chamber of Commerce supports this measure. The California State Labor, Labor Federation opposes this measure. And the CTA, as I mentioned, is also formally endorsed in opposition. Uh, the San Jose Mercury News and San Francisco Chronicle, along with the Sacramento Bee, have editorialized in opposition. The San Diego Union has editorialized in support. So that is sort of the split. <coughs> on Proposition 5. Then we get to Proposition 6, uh, which is the repeal of SB 1, which established the gas tax in the state legislature. And this measure was referended to the ballot via signatures. SB 1 raised the gas tax for road construction and repair for local roads and state highways, as well as some support for public transportation. The, the sort of problem statement for this that was listed uh, somewhere in the ballot is that the last time the gas tax was raised was in 1992. The gas tax, while never wildly popular, is a pay-as-you-go tax for roads. It's a user pays. So you have a certain tax you pay when you get a gallon of gas. That goes for roads. The problem since 1992, the last raise, is two things. One is, is that the amount of gas tax sinks every year by inflation, so that sort of in real dollars of the tax, it's sunk by 40 or 50 percent since 1992. The other problem is, is people are buying much more efficient cars. And so uh, a lot of people had gas guzzlers in 92 that might have gotten 15 miles a gallon. Now they're driving cars that are 30 miles a gallon. That means they might be driving the same amount of miles on roads, but with half the money coming back for roads. So there's been this huge deficit built into the road program. And if we're going to keep up, and it, it is, some of this money goes to local roads, there's a reason that most of the local officials support this, because particularly in Santa Cruz County unincorporated area, where there's roads with the mountains slipping and hard to maintain, uh, having a boost in money helps them maintain the difficult to maintain roads in the mountains. Specifically, SB1 did the following. It increased base gasoline excise tax by 12 cents per gallon, diesel sales tax by 4%. It set uh, certain fixed rates. It created the transportation improvement fee which raises from 25 to 175 a year, and a fee specifically for zero emission vehicles, which don't 
supply gas and use the road. So there's uh, $100 per year for model years that are 2020 and later. It also provides for inflation adjustments in the future so that what happened after 1992 wouldn't happen going forward. And um, when all the taxes are in effect, it raises roughly 5.1 billion a year uh, for, for roads and public transit. And uh, the state constitution requires that nearly all of these be spent on transportation purposes. Uh, Senate Bill 1 dedicates about two-thirds of the revenue to highway and road repairs with the remainder going to other programs such as mass transit. And, and I have to make one sort of personal observation that is a shameless plug. And that is, is there's this minuscule amount, a nano percent, that goes to off-road vehicles and voting in waterways, so it has gone to the state park system. And there would have been a windfall of $80 million a year to those two programs under the existing permit. Uh, the bill allowed that $80 million to go to the broader state park system for transportation purposes, and it has uprighted the state park's budget for the first time in at least a decade. So that is a piece of this. And since Santa Cruz is one of five or six counties that is parks rich in state parks. That has a big uh, local impact. This measure has been incredibly partisan. Uh, um, it was used as the basis of recalling Senator Josh Newman from a district that covered uh, Orange County and Los Angeles County at the June election. He was the deciding vote for the two-thirds. The Republicans targeted him at the recall. He won in the high turnout election of the Clinton-Trump uh, general election. He won by a few thousand votes. They ran the same candidate against him, and they unseated him with the, uh, at a lower turnout election, the June primary, with the gas tax being the heart of the argument as to why he should be repealed. Uh, the major donors... Uh, in favor of this initiative, which repeals, include Congressman Kevin McCarthy, Steve Scalise from Louisiana, uh, even there's $50,000 from House Speaker Paul Ryan, um, and many Republican state legislators, uh, federal and uh, state, are in support. It's been a major plank in the platform of John Cox, who is uh, the Republican candidate for governor, and he actually is one of the signers of the ballot measure in favor of this proposition. And among the other high profile people signing the measure in support of repeal are John Kupal of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association and John Kabatek of the Federation of Independent Business. In opposition to Prop 5 are Governor Jerry Brown, I, excuse me, Prop 6, uh, Governor Jerry Brown, Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, numerous Democratic legislators, and signing the argument were Brian Rice of the Professional Firefighters, Mark Gillarducci, the Director of the Office of Emergency Services, and Doug Villars, the President of the California Highway Patrolman Association. Thus far, the $3.3 million has been raised in support of this measure. About two-thirds was spent on qualifying the measure. Uh, the largest contribution was 466000 from the California Republican Party. As I mentioned, 300000 from Kevin McCarthy, 250 from John Cox for governor. Over $24 million has been raised in opposition. Uh, the largest contributors include Alliance for Jobs, $3 million, $1.6 million from the Laborers Union, $1.4 million from the state building trades, $1 million from organizations such as uh, the Carpenters, and uh, some other labor organizations. Uh, the state Democratic Party opposes Proposition 6. The state Republican Party supports Proposition 6. In a very unusual alliance, both the State Labor Federation and the State Chamber of Commerce both oppose Proposition 6. The State Chamber of Commerce was strong in the adoption of SB1, believing that for business uh, uh, roads were important. That explains the labor was always there. That explains that unusual alliance. The League of Women Voters opposes Prop 6. 
the San Francisco Chronicle and the San Jose Mercury News were the only ones that I have seen thus far that have editorialized. They've editorialized in opposition to Proposition 6. So uh, I'm surprised with that much money that we haven't seen more ads yet. Saida? Um, yes, this is a majority vote, but it required two-thirds to adopt the original tax as a bill in the legislature. That's where I might have been confusing, because uh, uh, Josh Newman provided the 27th vote in the Senate. But it's just a simple majority. So 50% uh, plus one on either yes or no will carry the day on this ballot measure. Thanks for uh, asking. Uh, Proposition 7 is one of those where can't believe we're voting on this, uh, but we are voting on daylight savings time. Um, it, it reminds me that when I was in the legislature, the fourth graders, uh, that's the California history year, and so classes of fourth graders would always come through uh, the Capitol, and my staff would get a committee room, and we would introduce a bill that outlawed homework and we would divide them into two and make them argue about it. And, and that's the, that, that sort of came to mind now that we're voting on daylight savings time. Um, it um, passed the legislature to be uh, put on. And there, there's some interesting nuances about this. Uh, because Proposition 7 would allow the California legislature to establish permanent year-round daylight savings time. It's not permanent year-round standard time. It's permanent year-round daylight savings time. And uh, there's a two-thirds vote of the Federal Uniform Time Act um, needs to be changed to allow for this. Uh, this isn't allowed by federal law, and what this ballot proposition would do is say that the state could choose to do this if the feds changed the law. And the reason the ballot measure is required is the voters in 1949 adopted a ballot measure that established daylight savings time in California. And that ballot measure would need to be repealed to be able to consider doing daylight savings time full time. So the legislature can only take action if the federal government changes the law allowing it and this passes, which allows the legislature to act in case the feds change the law. Then, once you get by those complications, then it just gets to the issue of how you feel about this. And, uh, you know, there's an argument about both the benefits and the drawbacks. It's the ballot argument in favor shows that there are health issues in the days after a time change, and that would eliminate people being stressed or tired or car accidents from happening, whatever it is that uh, uh, happens after that. And the ballot argument against says there's no real energy savings by moving to full-time daylight savings time, which I didn't see in the pro-ballot argument, but somebody must have said because the ballot argument against is arguing against that. And so um, the Camps and Chew who represents Southern Alameda County and Northern Santa Clara County was the proponent of this. Senator Hannabeth Jackson of Santa Barbara is the opponent. They both have signed the respective uh, ballot arguments. And there appears to be no money raised on either side. Nobody's contributing uh, heavily uh, to influence the daylight savings time issue. <laughs> well, the Democratic Party opposes it. The Republican Party is sitting on a fence, taking no uh, position. Neither the State Labor Federation or the State Chamber of Commerce has taken a position. Uh, the Modesto B and the San Francisco Chronicle are the only newspapers I know that have taken a position. They both oppose Proposition 7. So this is one where you go into the voting booth by yourself and examine your conscience. <laughs> um, proposition 8 is on dialysis clinics. And Proposition 8 would require dialysis clinics to issue refunds to patients or patient payers for revenue above 115% of the direct cost to patient care and health care improvements. To boil this down as simply as possible, this is really a battle between the unions and the dialysis clinics. 
and it's over rates and pro uh, profitability. And I assume, even though it wasn't said in the arguments either way, that worker rights or pay in this uh, are an issue. You might have seen a commercial that ran regularly through the summer showing a nurse uh, looking into the camera and say, they're at it again. They're running another initiative. And all the initiatives had been run before. That was about this ballot measure. That was setting it up that, that um, this is leverage from a union that has lost a lot of ballot measures in the past. Uh, in addition to what I said already, this initiative would require annual reporting to the state regarding clinic costs, patient charges, and revenue. It would prohibit clinics from refusing to treat patients based on the source of payment for care. And so the interesting thing about this is most of the people that get dialysis related to kidneys get it in clinics that are run under what is the subject of this measure. Um, half of the dialysis clinics in California are run by one for-profit company alone, DaVita, and a second for-profit clinic, uh, I think you pronounce it Fresenius, has about 25% of the market equal to all the rest of the providers that are non-profit. So 75% are with two for-profit, 25% are non-profit, and this ballot measure would make the for-profit companies less profitable or, in the words of those two companies, not profitable at all. And so it's, there's no certainty about whether this has an impact on the state fiscally. So of the funding for the campaign, it falls in those categories of those three that I mentioned. SEIU Healthcare has put in uh, 17 million in support, and the two big companies, DaVita and Fresenius, have put in roughly 47 million against. So that is the nature of the fight. Uh, interestingly, in the last few days, another late-breaking story, the campaign um, against this measure from those two companies has given $2.15 million to the Republican Party. And so there's a belief that the Republican Party will add uh, opposition to this major to their slate cards, and that's what it is, although that's conjecture. You have to see how it's reported and how the Republican Party spends the money, but that has just happened. As a result, also late-breaking, just last night, and I'm sure there's other people in this room that got the email, the chair of the state Democratic Party said, we're prioritizing the yes vote on this ballot measure. Um, so it's one of those where uh, it's sort of Star Wars around a fundamental dispute that is going on. And the San Francisco Chronicle actually said that this is being done in reporting, I believe, said this is being done uh, in regard to union organizing. And the union says that they have to do this because the workers are intimidated in the work site and can't organize. And the companies then point out, but they don't vote to organize. So that, once again, gets down uh, to that difference. As I mentioned, the Democratic Party supports Proposition 8. The Republican Party opposes Proposition 8. Uh, the Labor Federation supports Proposition 8. The State Chamber of Commerce opposes Proposition 8. Um, the San Francisco Chronicle, Sacramento Bee, San Diego Union Tribune, and San, Diego, Mer uh, San Jose Mercury News have all editorialized in opposition. So that is Proposition 8. <clears throat> proposition 9 has been removed from the ballot, so I get to go directly to Proposition 10, uh, which is probably one of the most uh, hotly contested uh, measures, and if Measure M in Santa Cruz is any indication, it's, it's, it's sort of the same issue at the state level. And it's really about rent control and the state. In 1995, the state legislature adopted the Costa-Hawkins bill, which restricts the scope of rent control policies that cities and other local jurisdictions may impose, and superseded pieces of local rent control 
uh, ordinances in the state. I think roughly one-fifth of Californians live under some form of rent control. The biggest ones are San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Jose, which probably accounts for almost uh, all of that, although I know Santa Monica, Berkeley, a few others are in there. <coughs> In accordance with California law, uh, this further provides that rent control policies may not uh, violate a landlord's right to a fair financial return on the property. And since the Costa Hawkins was adopted in 1995, um, that was affirmed by court cases. So that is settled law due to the courts at this point. This measure, which qualified by petition, would repeal Costa Hawkins. That's just what it does. I will go through all the impacts, but it basically takes that law and by initiative repeals it. It has a local angle because uh, Major M on the Santa Cruz ballot would be affected by this um, on whether or not everything could go into effect. That's in Major M if it passes and, and Costa Hawkins is repealed or not repealed. Um, it ha Costa Hawkins creates three main limitations on rent control ordinances. First, rent control cannot apply to any single family homes. A second, rent control can never apply to any newly built housing completed after February 1st, 1995. And third, rent control laws cannot tell landlords what they can charge uh, a new renter when first moving in, which is known as vacancy decontrol. Um, and uh, I mentioned that one-fifth of Californians live in a jurisdiction with rent control. In most of those cities, there's a rent control board that administers rent, uh, administers rent control. And frequently in those areas, a fee is charged to landlords to fund the program. Um, the repeal of Costa Hawkins would mean that rents could be limited on any housing, because it would repeal the, the single family dwelling part. It would allow the possibility of limiting, limiting how much a landlord could charge for rent when a new renter moves in. And it does not change local rent control laws. With a few exceptions, the cities and counties would have to take local actions to change their law to match the repeal of Costa Hawkins if it happens. And this measure uh, also writes into law, doesn't just repeal Costa Hawkins, it writes into law the fair rate of return. So the clarity that the court made is actually put into law with this measure. And if this passes, it shifts the discussion over rent control to local jurisdictions. And um, advocates contend that rents would be held down and tenants would move less, less often. Opponents uh, contend that there'd be less investment in rental stock and some owners would sell their rental housing. There's probably two ways to look at this, and it's reflected in two of the main editorials that have happened in newspapers. Uh, uh, one is, is that uh, this is a local control issue, not a rent control issue. And by repealing it, it allows local control for cities or counties to do whatever they want. And that's what the Sacramento Bee editorialized. You may hate rent control, but that's not the issue here. So the Sacramento Bee supported this, saying it was local control. And just to, to add one thing, when Mike and I were on the city council in the 80s, there was a, um, a volunteer at the Santa Cruz AIDS Project that was fired from her job in Santa Cruz for volunteering at the AIDS Project. The boss was freaked out. It was before a lot was known. He thought they were threatened. So I ended up introducing and wanted to get passed a non-discrimination ordinance on the basis of HIV in the city. And in closed session, and you're not supposed to talk about that, but it's 31 years ago. In closed session, the city attorney says the state has occupied the field. The state has basically, they haven't passed a bill, but they're debating bills. And so that means that the state has the control over and we worked with the city attorney to figure out a way to move ahead uh, anyway. But that's the sort of state control, local control issue is there. The other half of that issue is, is that there is a state interest 
in deciding how rent control should operate in the state. That if, as opponents to rent control contend, that it takes housing out of stock, and that uh, th there are other issues that make rent control not worth it, then there is a state interest in doing exactly what Costa Hawkins did. And the San Francisco Chronicle has editorialized uh, with that point of view, and they oppose Proposition 10. So that is sort of where the fault line is, and believe me, it's a fault line. And so um, this was proposed by the executive director of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. And if that name sounds familiar, Michael Weinstein, it's because two years ago when I was doing this, he was the sponsor of two ballot measures that were on the ballot. The one that said porn stars uh, had to wear condoms. And nothing gave me great pleasure than doing this presentation two years ago, looking out at a crowd like this, and uh, telling them that it it gave you a private right of action, and so telling you that when you were watching your porn, if you were upset, you could file a lawsuit. And it was fun to just look at the crowd and see how they reacted to that. Uh, the second one is he did the about measure that would have limited pharmaceutical pricing. It was defeated by a little bit. It was overwhelmingly opposed by the pharmaceutical industry. Bernie Sanders supported it, but that was on the measure two years ago. So in the late reporting of campaign contributions, amazingly this week, there was $500,000 from Pharma, the pharmaceutical organization of drug companies, against Proposition 10. And this measure has nothing to do with pharmaceuticals except that they're still mad at the proponent from two years ago. And uh, uh, so they're going to take a shot at him uh, uh, by doing that. And, and he is not a very popular guy in the broader sense anyway. So the uh, AIDS Healthcare Foundation is the one major contributor in support. They have given $12 million in support of this measure. Opposition committees have raised $33 million, although there's another report, and maybe it's with the late, that shows that it's over 40 <clears throat> and closer to 47. Two of the largest contributors I have found are Michael K. Haiti, <coughs> who's given almost $4 million against. I don't know anything about him except he's CAO of a real estate firm. And Blackstone Property Partners have given $3.3 million in opposition. Uh, the California Democratic Party supports Proposition 10. The California Republican Party opposes Proposition 10. The California Chamber of Commerce opposes Proposition 10. The State Labor Federation and the California League of Women Voters support Proposition 10. Uh, the Los Angeles Times and Sacramento Bee have editorialized in favor of Prop 10. Uh, the Sacramento Bee has editorialized in opposition. The ballot statements in support are signed by leaders of the California Nurses Association, California Alliance for Retired Americans, California Teachers Association, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SEIU California, and the Eviction Defense Network. The ballot statements in opposition to Proposition 10 have been signed by the NAACP at the state level, the California Small Business Association, the California Senior Advocates League, the American GI Forum, and the California Association of Realtors. And let's see. I can't remember. I said the B and the uh, the Times. Um, the Chronicle has editorialized, as I mentioned earlier, against, just to be clear about that. And the Chronicle statement was about it would lower the amount of rental housing available, and the Chronicle believed that was the experience in San Francisco with rent control. So that's probably one of the hotly contested ones. Pedro. Well, the president signed, but money came to the NAACP as an organization. And so I, I just can't tell you off the top whether the NAACP as a board has actually voted. But the name is being used by the president, and money came to the NAACP. <clears throat> and, and then we get to the last two measures. And Proposition 10, 11 is about ambulance employees' working conditions. And 
and the issue there is it makes labor law ent entitling hourly employees to take work breaks for meals and rest without being on call, and it regulates the timing of meal breaks for these employees. It eliminates employers' liability and actions pending on or after October 15, 2017 for violations of existing law on work uh, breaks. It requires employers to provide training regarding, regarding certain emergency incidents, violence prevention, and mental health and wellness. And it requires employers to provide employees certain mental health services. The root of this ballot measure is in a 2016 California Supreme Court decision in Augustus versus ABM Security Services. And so it's interesting, because the California Supreme Court decision is about security guards. It doesn't deal with ambulance employees at all. But the ambulance companies are convinced that since the Supreme Court is held there, if any action was brought against them and their existing lawsuits brought against them that were uh, referenced in the ballot measure. It's a matter of time before they get there, and they want this ballot measure to clear up the argument before it is the subject of a court suit. And uh, there was an attempt in the legislature since the court decision to try to address this issue. And uh, AB 263, it's by Freddy Rodriguez of Pomona in the State Assembly, and he is generally viewed as a pro-union person, introduced the bill, and it made it through the assembly, but was held in the Senate. And they wanted to clarify um, the issue on break time, that uh, it would just apply to major calls, not minor ones, and um, also that they wanted the break time to be paid at a premium rate. The ambulance companies balked on the premium rate. The others balked on the fact that it might get them out of existing lawsuits, and the bill didn't move. As a result, um, this was referended to the ballot with the American medical response being the major donor in support of $11.9 million. And it was in support signed by an emergency physician, the former director of the Los Angeles County Emergency Medical Services, and a licensed paramedic. And there was no argument submitted in opposition to this measure. The Democratic and Republican parties are both in support. The California Labor Federation and California Teachers Association are in opposition. The State Chamber of Commerce has taken no position. So the Santa Rosa Press Democrats, Sacramento Bee, and Santa Cruz Sentinel have editorialized in favor. The San Francisco Chronicle has editorialized in opposition. And their point was is that this issue should be fixed in the legislature with all parties at the table, not by uh, a vote. And so it would really, there's still a couple of thorny issues that aren't exactly addressed by this initiative or worked out to the satisfaction of some of the stakeholders, thus the union opposition. And so, uh, and yet you can see no argument was submitted in opposition. So it is really the ambulance companies versus the unions on a couple of the final issues. And the question is, is are those big enough issues to warrant a no vote or, or, and have it go to the legislature? Or is this much to do about nothing and people should just vote for this? So another one where you go into the voting booth and examine your conscience on ambulance pay rates. And then the last one uh, on the ballot measure has to do with confinement of farm animals. And this one, I got to confess, no matter how many times I reread some of the things has confused me a little. And you'll get it when you hear who's in support and opposition, because it relates to the confinement of farm animals. And in 2008, uh, the voters approved Proposition 2, which went into effect in 2015, which dealt with this issue. And I remember at the time, um, because I couldn't believe that we, we lost marriage rights at the same uh, 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 ballot that we protected how many feet a chicken could have in a, a, a confinement. But the voters were really for the chickens in that uh, 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 measure. And, and so what this does is it attempts to address 
some of the issues that were left unaddressed by the first one because it gave enforcement uh, a pass in the 2008 measure and local law enforcement agencies were the ones that were having to step up and decide whether chickens had enough space. You know, your, your county sheriffs were having to deal with that. This specifies <clears throat> that the California Department of Food and Agriculture will be the enforcing agent and the only real cost, it's estimated to be up to 10 million in enforcement, would be whatever the cost is of the California Food and the Department of Food and Agriculture to do that. And then also, um, there wasn't much uh, penalty, and this actually uh, would ban the sale of meat and eggs um, from, and I'll just say this once so you know, from calves raised for veal, breeding pigs, and egg-laying hens, um, so that this actually would ban the sale if they don't uh, operate with the correct amount of space for the animals. That wasn't in the last one as well. And then it actually um, sort of repeals and replaces the size by being really specific. About 43 square feet of usable floor space for calf, 24 square feet of usable floor space per pig, and then one square foot of usable floor space per hen. And then it defines down to chicken, turkey, duck, goose, or guinea fowl. Uh, and it's even shell eggs and liquid eggs. So it gets down to being really specific. And, um, and beginning in 2021, the producers would be required to confine egg-laying hens in cage-free housing systems based on the United Egg Producers 2017 cage-free guidelines. So that's what it does. Um, and, <clears throat> and, and then I get confused by seeing who's supporting and opposing it. Because the ballot arguments in favor were signed by the state director of the Humane Society, a professor of large animal medicine, Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association, Central Valley Eggs, the Animal Protection and Rescue League, and the Director of Strategic Programs Engagement for Farm Forward. And the arguments against were signed by representatives of Californians Against Cruelty, Cages, and Fraud, Action for Animals, Humane Farming Association, and Friends of Animals. And the Humane uh, Society is the largest contributor of the 4.3 million that has been raised for this. They've contributed 1.9 million. And an individual, and I cannot find an affiliation for her to be able to explain why, an individual named Deborah Stone contributed 1.65 million. Pardon? For, yes. uh, uh, for the ballot measure. And then in opposition are the Association of California Egg Farmers and the National Pork Producers Council. But here's the place I get confused. Uh, also opposing it are the Humane Farming Association and PETA, the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals. So, and PETA apparently says that this creates a horrific multi-level cage-free factory system. So that's where I got confused. Uh, I thought this was in favor of protecting the rights of the, of the individual uh, animals and PETA is, is opposed to it. And there are five major organizations listed in opposition. The Association of California Egg Farmers, Friend of Animals, Humane Farming Association, National Pork Producers, as well as PETA. The Democratic and Republican parties are united in opposition to Proposition 12. The California Labor Federation is in support. The California Chamber of Commerce has taken no position. The Santa Cruz Sentinel and Mercury News have editorialized in support. The Santa Rosa Press Democrat, <coughs> which covers Petaluma and some heavy egg producing areas, has editorialized in opposition. I wish I could tell you more. Well, uh, their state website uh, uh, says they're in opposition. So, um, but that's great. If, if the Democrats are in support, I stand corrected. And I will go home and see if that switched since I downloaded it or something. Or that I read it wrong in case that, yes. But I, I, I will look at that. Yes. Just 
Yes. The, uh, the question was to mention that Ballotpedia is a good source uh, for this. They have a page on each individual proposition. I found that I had to also go to the ballot pamphlet to get a lot more in the specific text and other things. And the Secretary of State <clears throat> also uh, does a 10 largest donors to each side of things page. It's hard to get to, but once you get to it, it's really helpful. And now that there's a 24 hour reporting period on any contribution over $1,000, and the fact that one just came in three days ago for 500,000 that was really informative, uh, that is changing by day. And so Ballotpedia, but you can also get in the mail or download. You can go to the Secretary of State's website and download the ballot pamphlet if you don't have it yet. And then uh, Secretary of State's campaign finance. And then I find a lot of times, if you just Google the newspaper's name and proposition, you find out. I have a friend in Sacramento that's actually keeping a spreadsheet where they send it out every three or four days what, and they just started this cycle, what newspapers have done what thus far. And sometimes that's helpful. And, and so uh, unless there's a, a clarifying question, I think I'd just take any questions uh, afterwards. And thank you for bearing with the wonkiness of this.